Hey, one more thing before you go. Today, we're going to have a conversation about childhood sexual violence, domestic abuse, and alcoholism, as well as mental illness in a way that shatters the walls of the stigmas that surround these topics. Overcoming these tremendous odds of negativity to triumph and create an environment to help other people going through the same thing come out through the light. I'm your host, Michael Hurst. Welcome to One More Thing Before You Go. This is The Thing About the secrets that define our lives. My guest in this episode is Charlene Madden. She's a woman who has spent most of her life living in a state of darkness. After experiencing over nine years of sexualized trauma at the hands of her grandfather, a decade of domestic violence and three plus decades of mental illness and suicidal ideology, she was just two days away from taking her life when she attended a woman's workshop where everything changed. She was able to take her blinders off, begin the healing process and find her purpose to reclaim her life by spreading her message of hope, faith, evolution, and transformation that she now shares with people all over the world. Charlene is an advocate for mental health, creator and host of at Ignite Your Life BC on Instagram. She's a life strategist, a promoter of self-responsibility, an author, a speaker, a wife, a mom, and welcome to the show. One more thing before you go. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the opportunity to share your story. Uh, it's an amazing journey, and it's an amazing journey of triumph over tragedy. Uh, so I'm excited to kind of unfold your life. I'm excited to be able to share it. You know, it. I, I like to start at the beginning. You know, I uh, this, and, and one more thing before you go, I think that, you know, everybody has something to say that's important, and there are things that uh, some people did not have the opportunity to say. And in this particular case, this conversation, we're going to share with some people um, some hope, some inspiration, some motivation that you you have opportunity to uh, to come out on top and to come out in the light. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Ontario, Canada. I live up here in Canada. And um, I grew up in a small town. Uh, it was called Durham, Ontario, and uh, it was small, 2,500 people, kind of what we would call kind of cottage country. It was um, it was the type of place where everyone knew their neighbors and kids played out on the streets and um, there was not a lot of worries. Um, you kind of felt safe outside in that town. So it was a wonderful place to grow up. So in Ontario, now forgive my geography, but Ontario is, is that like the cold, cold, cold place? Or is that a, is that like right in the middle of Canada? Um, it's kind of above Michigan. Above Michigan so it would yeah. probably be similar weather to that, you know, quite a bit of, of cold and snow and definitely not warm like Arizona by any means. <laughs> uh, I don't. Well, I, I should be nice because I'm grateful I live here, but, um, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend moving to Arizona in the summertime. That That's, okay. that's a, that's a gimme. <laughs> uh, let's talk about your family. Um, what was your family like? Um, I was the youngest of four kids. I was, I had two half brothers who were twins and I had an older sister. Uh, my brothers were eight years older than me. My sister was four years older than me and I started my childhood living with my parents, um, but I that kind of fell apart when I was about three and a half. Um, my father was a pretty severe alcoholic and he tended to be violent when he drank. And unfortunately, his violence was um, normally directed at my brothers because they weren't biologically his, so they were easy targets. And um, my mom had a really difficult decision to make when I was three and a half of she wanted to leave the marriage, take the kids and go. Um, but my dad wouldn't let her take 
my sister and I. So she had to make a choice of uh, taking my brothers and ensuring that they were safe because she knew that staying with my dad might mean a death sentence to one of them because he the violence was increasing. So she could take the two kids, she couldn't save them or stay. And um, she made the decision to take my brothers and go. And about two weeks after she left, um, my dad realized that being such a bad alcoholic, he wasn't in any position to raise two little girls. So he contacted my maternal grandparents, my mom's parents, and asked if they would be willing to take us in. And um, my grandmother didn't skip a beat. She said, absolutely, she would take us in. And um, my grandmother was an amazing woman, super strong. Um, I always thought she was really far ahead for her time, uh, the, the time period that she grew up, because she believed that women should um, be independent, go to school, get a good education. She had very minimal education, maybe grade three, grade four. And she wanted, you know, to ensure that we got a good career so that we didn't depend on men. And as you said, um, as wonderful as my grandmother was, my grandfather was a pedophile. So that was the yin and yang of, of that childhood. Yeah, it's, an, it's really unfortunate that you had to experience that from, from such an early age, from both perspectives, an alcoholic father, which is, as we spoke prior to this interview, that you know I grew up in an, with both my parents being alcoholics, so I can empathize with you from that perspective, especially as a child, because you're kind of helpless in what you can mm -hmm. do and how you can you know, motivate through that, and it, I'm sure that it sticks with you. Um, when you. When you... We're with your grandfather when you um, were um, first approached by him in regard to the sexual acts that he was committing. Uh, how old were you? Um, I, I believe it started right when we moved in. Again, I was three and a half. My sister was seven. And um, he was a predator of convenience. So he always um, made sure, like my grandmother was, always giving to everybody else. And um, she took one day a week to make sure that she treated herself so she would go to bingo every Monday night. So uh, she would make sure that every Monday night we were tucked into bed and you know off and all ready to go. And um, the minute she would drive out of the driveway, we would kind of sit there and listen to her car pulling away. And then we would listen for my grandfather's footsteps to come up the stairs because we knew it was only a matter of time before he would make his uh, his way up into our bedroom. And my sister and I shared a bedroom at that time, two little single beds. So, uh, of course, my bed was the first one. So I was always the uh, the first stop when he came into the room and then he would move on to my sister. So my, you know, earliest memories, you know, really for four years old is, is experiencing that and just waiting for that Monday night visit. So. Yeah. It's gotta be terrifying from the, from your, that perspective, your, your age and your sister's age. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that you obviously knew that what was happening was wrong. Um, how did he prevent you from telling your grandmother or did you, did you, and, and how did that go? Mm, no, I know I never said anything as a child. And I think, um, it was the, you know, of course, always the don't say anything. And my grandfather was a very silent man. Um, he never spoke a lot. My grandmother was always the the domineering force in the uh, in the household. And I don't really have a lot of memories about, you know, being afraid of him. I think my fear was more if I said something this family that you know that I had um, was going to be taken away from me because we would be you know we would be removed from my grandmother we'd be taken from the house and I would lose the only family I knew and I mean for me as a child my grandmother was my son you know she was the only person who was there and uh, I could count on and I knew loved me and would never leave me and as a child that was my feeling so I think I was just so terrified that if I said anything, I would lose that relationship in my life. So the silence was was deafening at times as a child, but it uh, it was the fear of what I would lose for relationships. Yeah, and I'm sure that created an environment for your mental health 
to uh, deteriorate a little bit because you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, did you think that, uh, um, obviously there's other kids within that environment currently, you know, with regard to that, um, what kind of mental, mental health, I mean, we're going to touch upon this in, in a little bit more extensively, but, uh, what kind of mental health environment does that start to create being in that environment? Do you think? Uh, I lived in a constant state of hypervigilance. I was, um, you know, you talk about being aware of everything that was going on in the room. You know, my grandfather would enter the room and you would just be terrified of, you know, what, you know, I, I knew I was safe as long as my grandmother would, was there, but it was that sense of, of panic if she was leaving. And, you know, she said, you know, I'm going to leave you at home for a while. It was like a constant need to be with her because mm -hmm. I needed that feeling of safety and that protection. Now, did what, and, and I don't, forgive me for not knowing this, but uh, at what time, at what age do you start school in Canada? Um, I started school at five. I was five years old, so I went into kindergarten at five. Uh, pretty much same as here. So did mm -hmm. you get any relief from that? Did that, you know, help to alleviate anything? Um, I think being able to be out and be social with other kids and, and just feel, um, I think I always had this feeling of wanting to be normal and, mm -hmm. um, you know, because not growing up with my parents and, you know, parents divorcing, which where I grew up, it wasn't really a huge thing in the town. So just feeling like I always stuck out, and I mean, very early on in school, kindergarten and grade one, you know, I was a very tiny child growing up and, you know, so getting picked on and bullied on. So it just felt, um, I, I don't know if I said the abuse seemed to feel natural for me as, as a child, but, uh, you know, there was, it did give me a time to get away and, and I loved being outside. That was always my my passion as a kid so from that perspective yeah i i understand mm -hmm. that it it's a difficult um it's a difficult situation when it becomes normalized uh, and mm -hmm. and when people from the outside kind of consider that word they don't understand that once you're in it it's easier to normalize than mm -hmm. than to constantly fight it or be in in a state of agitation all the time from that yeah. perspective um, <clears throat> how long did this, how long did this situation take place? How long did your grandfather, um, molest or sexually assault both of you and your sister? Um, it was about nine years. I was, um, just over 12, 12 and a half. And my sister was 16 when everything came out and, um, she uh, was receiving the worst of the abuse. Um, she had, had been raped and, um, she was terrified at the age of 16, of course, that she was going to become impregnated by my grandfather and she desperately wanted to leave. She, you know, contemplated running away, but she knew that if she left the house, that there would be no one protecting me, that I would be, you know, left to his whims. And she definitely was more concerned about my well-being than she was her own because she stayed and um, she just went to school one day and it had just finally become too much she couldn't handle the uh, the stress and the emotional pain and she basically had a nervous breakdown at school and that's when everything came out and I remember coming home from school that day and and uh, you know she always was home from school before I was and my grandmother would always pick me up after school and um, coming in and she wasn't there and thinking how strange that was. And then getting a phone call from the police station saying that my sister was at the police station. So of course my grandmother jumped in her car and went down there and she got down at the police station. And they were like, where's your other granddaughter? And um, she's like, she's at home. Well, I was at home and so was my grandfather. So they were like, no, you need to go pick her up and bring her down here as well. And uh, she did and that's when you know we went into the police station and everything you know was brought out to uh to everybody my grandmother found out or whether or not she knew 
I don't know, um, but it came out, so there was no more hiding it. So, yeah, I think it's difficult in situations, especially with a, an individual like that. Not, you know, sometimes what we don't understand, but what goes on behind closed doors, basically, and um, mm -hmm. how people can shut things off. And I've dealt with, uh, you know, and members of my family, ex not my extended family, but. From my grandparents up, you know, there were some situations and um, that had come about within our family, within itself, that uh, we, me as a police officer, I, as I had to, when I first started my career, I was still naive and young and thought I was going to save the world type of thing, a asked the question, you know, why didn't anybody really notice or see this? But I think that comes back to um, the normalization perspective to survive. Mm hmm. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's, um, it's a difficult journey. So, <clears throat> um, did you have any coping mechanisms that you utilized? Did you have any, anything that you started to use to help you to kind of manage, you know, your life from that perspective or to move forward, move up from there? Mm. Well, once I went into high school, that's when I really started, um, dealing with the, the trauma of, you know, you're going into high school, it's already an emotional time. And then, you know, I'm going into high school feeling different than everybody else again, because mm -hmm. of what had happened, because of course, growing up in a small town, everybody knew. So, you know, as a teenager, having all these emotions being so overwhelming and no outlet for them, I started actually cutting that was my emotional escape was just, you know, when the emotional pain got too much, just creating a physical pain that would be enough that it would overwhelm the emotional pain that I could not think about it for a while. So cutting really became a, a, an outlet, a coping mechanism for me. And then, of course, going into high school, um, drinking and smoking marijuana. And, um, and then I actually came upon writing as a coping mechanism that became a little healthier outlet for me at the time. And I, I did a lot of writing and poetry as a way of expressing the, the grief and the trauma that mm -hmm. was built up inside. So now do you, um, can we touch back on cutting just so, mm -hmm. can you help our listeners and our viewers understand what cutting is? I, I know what it is and you know what it is, but can we help them maybe understand uh, exactly mm -hmm. what that is and why? Yeah, so basically I would take a whatever sharp object I could find, whether it was anything from safety pins to razor blades to um, knives, if I could get them out of the kitchen. And um, I would cut body parts um, till I bled as a way of just, like I was saying, to create that pain. And, you know, it was always in areas that are, that are hidden in that when I was at that age, it wasn't like, you know, my grandmother wasn't seeing those parts of my body anymore. I was, it was private. So I could just create um, and inflict physical trauma on myself um, because that emotional overwhelm is so intense. Um, there's no outlet for that emotional pain. So you look for um, a physical outlet. And for me, that's what it was. It was just cutting and in, inflicting the physical pain on myself so that I could deal with the emotional pain. It was, um, you know, you would get that rush of, you know, endorphins that would rush through you and it would just in, you know, release all of that trauma that was built up at the time. So. Now was your grandfather, uh, I obviously was arrested in, I'm assuming mm -hmm. that there was a trial process in, so for did you have to testify and go in and, and talk in open court? No, he um, pled guilty in um, in a way to get a lesser sentence. So he uh, he served, and this is one of my pet peeves: is the fantastic legal system that we deal with. Um, he was in jail for less than six months. Wow. Um, so and this, a lot of it because of his age, because they felt that keeping him longer might be a, a death sentence for him. So, you know, I got a life sentence and he got six months. So it was a little frustrating at the time. 
I can uh, empathize with your frustration as a law enforcement mm -hmm. officer, career law enforcement officer. I believe that the justice needs to be served in regard to the consequences for actions and that uh, they need to warrant, you know, what it takes. They need to warrant the actions. The consequences have to define, you know, from the actions. And that, yeah, I'm sorry that uh, that's all we got. Mm -hmm. I think you should have gotten mm -hmm. more than that. I. Um, well, and the, and the difficult part was because once our abuse came out, um, my mom then admitted that she had, in fact, been raped and molested by her dad as well. So this was a lifetime of abuse that, you know, that had happened with no consequences, like you said. So it was, it was difficult as a child to, uh, to deal with at the time. I understand that. You know, and unfortunately, I found both personally and professionally in regard to that, that uh, that kind of trauma continues through generations. And unfortunately, that's how it becomes normalized because it, it is, well, that's just what happens. That's just what happens. And in reality, mm -hmm. it is not normal. And if somebody's experiencing anything like that or experiencing those incidents that take place like that, they need to take a proactive approach to removing themselves from that situation. And um, later we're going to talk about some methodologies and some outlets for people to do that you know, and help them kind of move forward. Yeah. So, <coughs> excuse me. You um. Obviously, you you uh, grew up with you you went to uh, to drugs and uh, to alcohol, and you could use that as a coping mechanism. You utilized the um, cutting as a coping mechanism. When did you kind of recognize that uh, the your mental health was affected to such a point that you needed to kind of take a closer look at that? Um, well, when I was doing all of my writing in school, of course, it caught attention of my teacher because it was very dark and depressing. And um, I was sent to the guidance counselor's office and then met with a school psychologist who they had come in. And I spent an hour or uh, an afternoon um, doing assessments, questionnaires, speaking with the school psychologist. And, uh, you know, I remember before the bell rang at the end of the day, she, you know, says, well, Charlene, I just want you to know we're diagnosing you as manic depressive bipolar. Wow. And I'm sitting and I'm sitting there going, OK, I'm not even 16 yet, but I have no idea what any of that means to me. It just means that I'm crazy now on top of everything else. And again, we're talking, you know, this is the 80s, early 80s. Um, I get a. Uh, if you need to talk, just know that we're here, book an appointment, we're available mm -hmm. for you anytime. That was the follow-up care at the time. And really the last thing I wanted to do was talk about any of it. I just wanted to stick my head in the dirt and pretend that nothing had happened. And um, so I kind of recognized that what I had was now um, a diagnosis of whatever kind, whether it was accurate, which, you know, was it accurate? No, I think it was, PTSD that I was dealing with non, you know, non dealt yeah. with trauma from my childhood, but it was easy just to label it. So now I just had another label to, uh, to pile on to me. So really it was just, it was a diagnosis with no follow-up treatment. So again, I'm, I'm stuck dealing with all of these, these emotions with, with nothing to use as a coping mechanism that was healthy at the time. So it and just, and I think that, uh, or forgive me, I'm sorry, uh, there's okay. a delay when on our connection. Um, the, the uh, You brought up a good point, uh, PTSD. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand that uh, because when they hear PTSD or they see most things about PTSD, they think of a soldier or they think of a, a, a police officer or a firefighter that has suffered some form of PTSD. But in, in reality, we all as individuals um, need to be cognizant of the fact that PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder, and it has to deal with a traumatic situation in our lives that has taken place within our lives that has affected us in a negative way or had an impact on us that affects change in how we react and how we feel and how we manage ourselves. So PTSD, you know, somebody coming from your situation 
coming from being through that traumatic sexual battery, the the um, everything that went along with it, the grief, the anger, the resentment, the everything that went with it is all part of PTSD. Yeah, and I mean, like I've recognized that now, and you know, I'm I'm so happy with the work that is being done, and like you said, it it um, it it's being more recognized as not just being a a combat or you know you know as yourself a police you know ex police officer, it, there's more to it than mm -hmm. than those those things. So it's uh, but I mean, back in the that time, it wasn't even a. Uh, a blip on the chart for I imagine that that school psychologist so it was just easier to crack yeah. open a, a, a textbook and say here's where you are so so yeah so I, I continued to struggle I didn't um growing up with my grandmother and what a strong force she was you know she really taught us to you know put her head down do the mm -hmm. work and um just plug you know plow through anything so I think that was my my way of dealing with it, my coping mechanism was just to keep going through life and just pretending that there wasn't a problem. And I did that for, you know, at least a whole nother decade until, you know, life basically threw me up against a wall and said, okay, we can't keep going like this. We have to make a change. And again, I didn't have the coping skills to make the correct mm -hmm. change. So at what point in your life did you kind of move forward into a uh... To, to let, did, I mean, if I can touch upon this, um, had you become more of an alcoholic or more into drug use as your life progressed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely started drinking heavier. Uh, I, when I graduated high school, I moved from where I was living and I kind of thought that if I moved, everything would be better. Um, I, that's where I started my geographical coping mechanism. And, um, but didn't matter where I went, there I was again, because I didn't have any, I was carrying this trauma with me from place to place. Right. So I went through all my twenties. And I mean, I had, for, um, when I left school, I moved with my high school sweetheart. And uh, we decided to start a family uh, relatively young. I was 20 when I got pregnant, had my daughter at 21, uh, my next daughter at 25 and my son at 27. And I think having children I thought was going to fix the pain that I carried with me. I thought they were going to fill the holes and the voids that I had, but uh, it didn't. It actually just seemed to crack those holes open wider and wider because I had guilt of not being um, a good mom, of not being, you know, a person, the person that I wanted to be. I wanted to break that generational cycle of trauma and I felt I was just propagating it at once again. So um, when I was 28, I actually sat my husband down because I had become extremely suicidal and, uh, and just said, you know, I need to, um, I need to leave the household right now. I'm not fit to look after myself, let alone three young children. And I don't want them to find me dead, basically. And uh, my marriage was pretty much over, I would say at that point, because he didn't really bat an eye when I, when I said I was leaving. And um, I left the house and then just went into a deeper spiral of, of uh, drinking. Um, I wasn't really doing drugs at the time, but um, just drinking heavily. Uh, and, and then I jumped into a, an extremely toxic relationship only a month after I left my husband. And that led to uh, uh, a decade of domestic violence. So, Yeah, it is. Do you feel that your your PTSD and everything that you grew up with in regard, which obviously is, is a traumatic from an early age is embedded within you. That traumatic incidents that took place, the guilt the resent and everything else that come along with it, the guilt, the anger, the resentment, I'm sure that, that you were burying within your soul. Um, do you think you were drawn more to uh, a toxic relationship do you, th from that perspective? I do. I think I thought that that's what I deserved. I was so uh, accustomed to the abuse. And I mean, especially when I jumped into that um, relationship, because I had so much guilt um, surrounding my children, because here I had just repeated the pattern of what my parents had done. I had just mm -hmm. abandoned my own children. 
And now, you know, so when I started experiencing the domestic violence, it was almost as if I felt it was karma. You know, I was getting what I deserved because I was a bad person. So all these things were happening because I was a bad person. And so you just, you know, step into that role as being, you know, the victim because that's where you think you're supposed to be in life. So at what point did you recognize that you needed to remove yourself from that situation and kind of go in a more positive direction? I'm a really slow learner. I will say that. Um, I was two years into the relationship when after a really bad night of abuse, uh, he had left the apartment and um, I decided I couldn't live like this anymore. And my option was never, you know, leave, you know, the relationship. My option was leave life. So I went to my medicine cabinet. I emptied out all of the uh, pain medications, sleeping pills, and I took them all. And I went and sat down on my couch with a pad of paper and a pen, and I started writing a goodbye letter to my children. And um, it was hands down the most difficult thing I ever have had to sit down and write, but it also saved my life because I realized that I was abandoning my children in the most final way, and I couldn't do that. So I called a cab, I jumped in a cab, went to the emergency room and was sitting at the emissions desk explaining what I had done when I collapsed. And when I woke up, I was laying in a bed with tubes down my throat with my partner beside me crying, saying how sorry he was. And um, the next day I got out of the hospital, my mom contacted me because my partner had let her know that uh, what had happened. And she said, I think you need to pack yourself and the kids up, bring them across the country. And um, we will help you get on your feet. We'll help you start over and, and create a life that you're, you know, happy in. And again, this fit right into my pattern of running, because you know, if you change locations, everything will be better. So I did that I moved my kids across the country. And um, we went to stay with my parents and my mom and my stepdad. And um, six months later my partner said hey i want to move out there with you i'm sorry i miss you uh, i realize now you know what a fool i was everything will be different and um, i so desperately wanted to believe that because i just wanted someone to love me enough to treat me well and uh, so out he moved and this continued another 10 years of complete uh, dysfunction of both of us being alcoholics. Uh, he went into doing harder drugs. Um, and, you know, just the violence continued. And um, it was in 2015, actually, that he came home one evening and said he was moving out that he uh, was tired of being in a relationship with me and had found someone else and was moving in with them. And uh, I was absolutely crushed. I felt abandoned once again, and um, he moved out, and I decided I was going to uh, take this opportunity to, you know, get my life together, and I was on my path to that, and two and a half months after he left, I was at work, I was bartending at the time, and I just finished my shift, and a police officer walked in and uh, asked to see me outside, and he knew where to find me because he had been involved in a prior domestic uh, dispute. And so he took me outside and informed me that he had just came on shift and saw a notice on the board and wanted to come let me know that um, my ex-partner had committed suicide. He had shot and killed himself. And um, that just put me on a, a spiral downwards again. And uh, I got really angry and people you know i was sitting with a friend and she said that's normal you know anger is one of the stages of grief and said no i'm not angry that he took his own life because i could understand why he had done it i was just angry he had done it first because being there and seeing all the pain and the trauma and the heartache that that caused it was hard to think of ending my own life. And really, that's all I wanted to do. I didn't want to be here anymore. I didn't want to fight. I didn't want to 
live in pain. And um, I felt like that was what I was supposed to do. And this went on for another eight months, nine months. I um, started seeing a, psycho a psychiatrist, uh, trying to get help desperately. And uh, because I knew I was teetering on the edge. And, you know, I remember asking my psychiatrist because my personality type is, um, again, like my grandmother, just tell me what to do and I will do it. And uh, the psychiatrist kept wanting to talk about the past. And I was like, I don't want to talk about the past. I already know why I am the way I am. I just need you to tell me how to fix it. And I asked her what she had done to fix her own mental illness. And she said, I've never dealt with mental illness. And I felt an immediate sense of disconnect because how can you ex say that you understand how I feel if you've never experienced it? You've never been in the dark. You don't know what it feels like. And uh, so I set myself, you know, I walked out of that appointment and um, I set myself a goal to end my life within a month. I had just bought a house, was moving in as a way of uh, creating a financial legacy to leave to my children because I felt that's all I had. And um, I decided I was going to take my life. And two weeks before that date, I got invited to a women's workshop. And uh, that absolutely changed my life. Well, that's a positive thing from that perspective, because obviously you've been able to create an environment for other people that are going through this um, to kind of move forward in life. I, I respect an individual that wants to become a psychologist, and I respect an individual that wants to become a psychiatrist, you know, psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, clinical therapist. Um, but I also recognize the fact that it's very difficult for you to really empathize with an individual if you've not been through what you would what you're who you're discussing with if you haven't been through what they've gone through in some form or another it's difficult for you to really understand from a deeper level how to help fix that you can do it from a textbook the textbooks mm -hmm. and i'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this textbooks aren't 100 percent right you know you need to understand life experience and kind of what comes from that and that's where i think it benefits you from what you have created, what we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit here, but from what you created, you come from uh, a position of, I've been there, I've done that, I know what you feel like, I know how you feel, I know what you're feeling, and, and I can help you overcome that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was what made the, the difference for me, was knowing that other people, I mean, you know intellectually that other people have experienced what you've experienced, but um, being able to to hear people expressing and, and speaking about what they've gone through, it's uh, it's life changing. Yeah, one hundred percent. It it is. I think that I, again, I think you know what you've done is and where you've come in life is an amazing journey, and I, I commend you again for it. I know I said it before we started, you know, but I mean that because I've grown up in situation, uh, both personally and professionally, and and I can you know I understand where you're coming from. Um, what gave you the motivation to kind of find um, a deeper purpose in, in changing your purpose in life? I mean, the, I, I know that you, you again, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but was there one thing that kind of really opened your eyes that said, wait a minute, I, I really need to kind of change my purpose in life? I believe everybody's got a purpose, and sometimes our purpose changes. Mm hmm. Yeah, for me, it was that workshop. And it was, um, you know, a friend invited me to go. And the last thing I wanted to do was to go to a women's workshop. Um, but she wants, you know, she said, please, I want to go and I don't want to go alone. Well, of course, that just sucked into my always caring about other people more than myself. So I went to that workshop and the workshop started, it was a Saturday, Sunday, and the date I had set to end my life was the Monday. And so I pulled up to that workshop with my hunting rifle in the back seat with my, you know, bullets there, ready just to get through the, the, that weekend so that I could just end my pain and suffering. And I went into that workshop and for the first half of the Saturday felt just disconnected from 
all the conversations that were going on. And then the second half of the day, um, three speakers got up, a woman with alopecia got up and shared her stories of struggles with self-love and self-worth and how her life changed when she learned to love herself. And as you know, I was sitting in that seat, I heard that little voice that said, what about you? And I thought, yeah, what about me? Like, how different could my life have been if I would have just loved myself instead of needing validation from everyone else? You know, that the, all yeah. looking for that love I had never received. And then the next woman got up and she started talking about living with mental health struggles and depression and being suicidal for 20 years and how when she learned to embrace that darkness instead of keeping trying to push it away, she embraced it and brought it into the light. And she learned to accept that as being a part of her, that her whole life changed. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm sitting there going, you know, I hear that voice. What about you? And I'm brushing these off because my decision has already been made. And um, the last speaker gets up and it's a gentleman talking about going through divorce and being an alcoholic and losing custody of his kids and being um, depressed and suicidal and spending a year trying to find a perfect mix of pain medication, sleeping pills and alcohol so that he could overdose, but make it look accidental. And on a rare night, he had this visitation with his kids. He found that perfect mix and he was laying on his couch, overdosing with his kids in the bedroom next to him. When he heard a little voice that said, no, not like this, not today. There's more. And he was able to get to his phone, called 911, got help, got clean and sober, got into therapy, got the counseling he needed and was now sharing his stories. And for me, I was kind of sitting in my chair after hearing these three speakers going, what is going on right now? Like, wh what are the chances that I'm at an event that I didn't want to come to? And I've just heard three people touch on the three areas of my life that I've struggled the most with. Like, this cannot be mistake that I'm sitting here right at this moment. There's got to be a greater reason and a greater purpose for me to be sitting here. And I say in that moment, it was like a light switch moment where I was like, no, wait a minute. I want to live because if all of these people have gone through the same struggles I've gone through and they're now living and not just living, they're thriving and they're taking their stories and struggles and they are sharing it with other people and giving them hope. Why can't I? Maybe this is what I have been meant to do to share those experiences. And I, you know, I remember just like being filled, but with this overwhelming purpose of, no, I have a story to tell because I can help someone that's gone through what I've gone through. And I remember, you know, I, as soon as the event was over, I approached the, uh, the host of the event and I said, I want to sit down with you and tell you what this event meant to me because I wanted her to know I was so passionate to let her know that she had saved my life with that event. Mm. And, um, and I said, I would love to come back next year and, and share my story. And she was like, yeah, absolutely. Come back next year. So That's amazing. I did, I went back the next year and, and was able to share my story. So that's a, that's a unique perspective of the universe talking to you and you're listening. Mm. Well, and, and it's funny because it was just probably the last month that, you know, you know, telling this story over and over multiple times a day and really coming to the, the realization that I think because I had made my decision and I was at peace with ending my life, that I quieted that internal chatter that had been going on for so mm -hmm. long, right? All that fighting, internal fighting that was going on. And I was sitting in that room in such a place of internal silence that I was actually able to hear the messages that were coming through. Gave you and a pause. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, and so for me, it's like being able to, to slow ourselves down and get quiet so that we can hear those messages because there, everyone, there's a message coming in for you. You just have to be able to hear it coming in. So. Well, that's a brilliant opportunity for you to kind of, uh, as you put it, uh, inner phoenix rise from the ashes of your past and to mm -hmm. move forward. It, it, that's a, it's a wonderful thing that took place. And, and honestly, the person that invited you to that uh, 
women's shop. I mean, she's she's doing okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're uh, we're still good friends. And and uh, when I decided to uh, organize my own workshop, she was the first person I went to and said, "Hey, do you want to help me with this?" And hey, so we cool. were able to work together. Yeah. So it was really what an what a friend. She didn't realize that that you she had in you and you had in her to bring you at that point in time you know, to where you, where you were. That's a, that's amazing. It really is. That's pretty cool. Uh -huh. Actually. Um, I uh -huh. think we all strive to seek purpose in our lives. Everybody uh, has, as we talked about before um, we uh, started this conversation, you know, uh, I had to reinvent my life and create a new purpose for my life. And uh, you know, I'm enjoying that path. I think that uh, I can, I can see for those that are just listening to the podcast and not viewing it, um, you can see in your face that you're relaxed, you're happy, you know, you glow with uh, confidence and uh, the ability to kind of kind of share the 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 glee of being able to come through what you've come through because you you talk about it with triumph. You don't talk about it with mm -hmm. depression. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's, you know, and the word purpose can be really confusing for some people. And it's such mm -hmm. a big word because people think purpose has to be something huge, right? Like, you know, you're building schools in Africa or you're feeding the hungry or whatever you're doing. And I try to tell people that purpose doesn't have to be, you know, this huge thing for the world, right. but it's a huge thing for you. And it's a huge thing for your world when you step into and understand what it is that you're supposed to be doing, whether it's you're just a mom, no, I shouldn't yeah. say just a mom, whether you're a mom, it's like just being the best mom that you can be, whether you're making burgers at McDonald's, it's just being the best person that yeah. you can be in, in that moment of your life, because your purpose can change. Your purpose yeah. isn't one fixed thing. So it's, uh, it's just learning to, to embrace it, whatever it is. So. Do you think um, that's kind of like been the biggest catalyst in your life? The, the that experience within itself that really launched you into your new purpose and your new life with helping others? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because I left, um, when I left that workshop that, the uh, that weekend, I mean, I contacted a friend of mine and I was like, Hey, I need you to take all my guns. And, um, cause I, I'm an avid hunter. I love to hunt. And, and then I contacted my boss and I said, Hey, I need you to take all my pain medication. Cause I have a chronic pain disorder. And, you know, luckily the people in my life never batted an eye. They were just like, yep, okay, sure, whatever you need from us. And it just set me on the path to, okay, if we're going to do this, if we're going to live life, let's live it. And let's get serious about creating a life that we can be passionate about. And like you said, it's it's turning that pain into purpose and into passion. And, um, and me sharing my story has become such a passion and like i said when i went back that next year and spoke at that workshop um i always you know end off my my talks usually with you know my reason for sharing my story is that i can just reach one person who needs to hear my story and needs to hear this message of hope and if i can just save one life then everything i have experienced in my life is worth it and when I got off the stage, and of course that was my first speaking engagement, so I was making a beeline out the, the back door. And um, I had a woman stop me that had been in the audience and she said, Charlene, you said you wanted to save a life. I just want you to know that today you did. Oh. And she turned and walked and she turned and walked away and that was it. And again, I got really quiet and I still get goosebumps. I tell this story quite often, I get goosebumps. So you, you basically took that the first opportunity for that workshop with you and you just paid it forward to somebody else that was in your position. That's got to be an amazing feeling. Exactly. And as I was standing there, you know, kind of reeling from the what she had just said, um, you know, and I got quiet, I heard that voice in the back of my head that I've come to know and love. And it just said, now let's go find one more. So for me, every day is just about finding that one more person who needs hope and needs to know they're not alone. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. What resources um, have you found uh, can help you along the way and that we can share with others to have maybe help them either to recognize and or move forward from where they're at in, in their current situation? Mm. 
I always talk about embracing the three S's that I learned from that weekend. So number one, self-love for me was huge. I needed to know that I deserved to live a life that I could be passionate about. I didn't deserve to live a subpar life, regardless of what anybody else. So loving myself and then asking myself, okay, what would someone who loves themselves do? And I ask myself that constantly in every situation that I'm in, because it helps me make um, choices based on boundaries that I have with myself. And then getting really radically honest. And when I work one-on-one -on -one with clients, this is the one thing I say, and it's probably the hardest thing for people to realize is that you need to take an honest um, evaluation of your life. And I could have blamed everything that happened in my life on my past. And the reality was that where I was at my life at that point in time was because of the decisions I had made. And I had to step up and take responsibility for that and then I had to go forward and learn how to make better decisions. So I got really open and honest with the people in my life. I started having conversations about uh, my mental illness and the struggles that I had been experiencing because I wanted people to know uh, where I was at because I didn't want to do it alone anymore. I realized that I didn't have to. So um, getting you know resources, whether going to uh, I live in a smaller area, so mental health resources are kind of limited, but going online, I was able to find amazing resources and support groups, and then just, you know, finding any book, you know, whatever it was I was dealing with. I'm a voracious reader, so I love to, to read and just, you know, constantly do whatever healing that, uh, that I can. So, but I mean, the resources that you need I you have within you and this is one thing that people don't understand is that um, yes we can build on those resources but what you need right now in this moment you have within you you have the strength you have the will because if you didn't you wouldn't be here so it's just feeding those um, as I say fanning those embers of that phoenix that is inside of you it's just fanning those and and learning that you know what you have you have in veil inside of you available so just uh, embrace that. So. Those are some excellent resources. Do you, I mean, obviously you, you support the fact that we, um, those of us that are going through something similar to that or within, within that arena, uh, a good support system is always a positive thing to have and that, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. Absolutely. And I know, um, I know when I was in that position, um, you know, doing work, I had a, I had a list of phone numbers on my bedside table of people that I could call if I was feeling down. Did I ever pick up the phone and call them? No. Why? Because I didn't want to be a burden on anybody else's life. But let me tell you, the burden of having to bury someone that you love because they've committed suicide is a burden that most people don't want. And um, they would much rather you call them at three o'clock in the morning then have to deal with your loss because that pain lasts forever. So, but just finding a great support network. And if you feel like you don't have anybody, I mean, I always relay this message in any podcast I do is that if you feel you don't have a support network, you have no one that would understand in your lifetime. You don't want, um, you don't want people to know um, because of your social standing or whatever it is, whatever reason you don't want people to know, um, reach out, to me i am available 24 7 uh message me on facebook i always want people to know that you're never alone it doesn't have to be you know support groups don't have to be people that you know it's just people that love and care about you and i you know don't want anyone to suffer so it's there wherever wherever you are it's available it's an amazing opportunity for somebody to reach out i think that uh you, know, you just have to raise your hand you know and and, and speak and, and talk um, <clears throat> pardon me. Speaking about how to get in touch with you and how to get a hold of you, let's talk about uh, you have uh, an amazing opportunity for people to uh, get involved in making change in their life and moving it forward. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah, I work with people now. I do mostly work with women, but um, I offer... Uh, coaching sessions, one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with people who, um, you know, if you're if you're dealing with really severe mental health issues, of course, I'm going to find you 
uh, support for wherever you are. But if you feel like you're in a place where you know that you're just, you want to step into a different life and you just aren't sure and you need help and guidance, then that's what I am here to do. I do a, a workshop every year um, where I bring in different speakers on all different kinds of, of topics from trauma to abuse, domestic violence, or just overcoming struggles that you may be feeling in your life, you know, different things that you may be facing. And uh, I just want to provide healing platforms for regardless. And, and I do, you know, speaking for different organizations. And um, yeah, I just want to reach people. And as I said, for people to know that they're, they're not alone. And if they just need support, then I'm here for that. And what's the name of your website? And how do we how do we find it? Mm -hmm. um, my website is uh, www.charlenemadden-speaker.com. Um, and that's for for my speaking. I also have another website as well. It's uh, www.ascension wellness studio. And that's where you can find me for um, for one on one coaching as well. And again, on on all the social media platforms, Charlene Madden speaker on Facebook and Charlene Ann Madden on Instagram. And I'll make sure that all of those uh, forums are within the show notes so that anybody that's reaching out for help has the opportunity to connect with you on all those levels. I know that when you go to your website, you there's a, a place on there that somebody can download something that can uh, kind of help them a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I have um, a wheel of life and it's really just a basic um, a way of looking at life and seeing where you're at because sometimes we don't take the opportunity to really self-assess where we are and where we want to be. We're just so busy in the day-to-day -day life that we don't take a second to just go, okay, hey, where realistically, where am I? Where am I in my relationships? Where am I in my spirituality? Whatever that looks like to you. Um, where am I in my finances and my, and my health and wealth? And, you know, if you go, okay, I'm sitting at a five and I think realistically I want to be at a, you know, a nine. It's like, okay, so then how can we help you get from the five to the nine? How can we help you move whatever area you want to shift in your life and how can we get you to where you want to be so that you're living that life of passion and purpose? That's an amazing opportunity for somebody to, to kind of evaluate themselves in their present position. Uh, so thank mm -hmm. you for that. Um, <clears throat> Charlene, this is one more thing before you go. So before we go, do you have any words of wisdom you can share with us? Yeah, I want people to know that it's okay to not be okay. You know, we live in a society that, you know, is a social media, you know, tells us what our perfect days are supposed to look like and what perfect life is supposed to look like. And then we judge ourselves based on that. And I want you to know that not every day is going to be perfect. Not every day is going to be easy. And not every day has to be. You're going to have hard times. You're going to have days where you struggle. And, um, and it's okay. I want you to know that that's normal. We don't have to have it all together all the time. And if you have a day where you don't want to get out of bed, don't get out of bed. If you have a week where you don't want to get out of bed, don't get out of bed. But realize that no matter what you're going through and if you're in this dark place that you can rise out of it and you can again embrace that inner phoenix and and just blaze brightly into the light that's supposed to be there for you and the life that you're you're destined to live because you deserve to be happy outstanding words of wisdom Charlene. i really appreciate those um i think that everybody should pause take a moment and write those down and look at them on a regular basis So thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you sharing your journey and uh, everything that you have to offer to those of us that are looking for help in different various aspects of our lives, especially moving women forward um, from their situations into a very positive one. So thank you very much for joining me on the show. Well, thank you. And thank you for providing a platform for my message and others so that we can create those uh, ripples of impact that we want to make so that we can heal this world we're in. So we thank are, you. We are all in this together. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of One More Thing Before You Go, a unique conversation about life. 
If you like our show and want to know more, check out our website at beforeyougopodcast.com. That's beforeyougopodcast.com. Tell your story, share your expertise, contribute to the blog, and subscribe to the newsletter. You can find us as well as subscribe to the program and rate us on your favorite podcast listening platform. And one more thing before you go. Have a nice day, have a nice week, and thanks for listening. One More Thing Before You Go, a unique conversation about life podcast, is a creation of One More Thing Productions, established 2010, all rights reserved.